Hello, today is June seventeenth, two 2010. We're meeting today with Mr. John Brubaker at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, John, and thanks for sitting down to tell your story today. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm glad to see you. Wonderful. Let's start out. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Well, I was born February 12th, 1926, in the center, Colorado. That's the uh, southern part of the state in the San Luis Valley. Grew up on a farm. Went to school at Hooper, Colorado. Went there for 11 years. I skipped the second grade. Oh, is that right? I was a smarty. <laughs> <laughs> So they let me skip second grade, and I went. I graduated in '43. Now, did you have any brothers and sisters? I have an older brother and a younger brother. Okay, so you're a middle middle child. Um, yep. Okay. The older one was three years older, and the other was nine years younger. Okay. He was a little later. Okay. So uh, again, I graduated in '43. Uh, Worked on the farm that next summer, and then I got the letter as you all know said greetings <laughs> so on june 3rd of 44 i was called up to go to service okay before we jump into your your service mm -hmm. uh story let me ask if back up and ask you a few questions some historical questions do you have much memory uh of the great depression and, and did that have any effect on your family at all oh i had a great lot of effect on the family we were Pretty poor. We, uh, of course, were on the farm. We raised all our vegetables and mother canned everything. Raised our own chickens, hogs, and butchered the beef occasionally, but that's, that's the way we survived. Wow, wow. We would go to a picture show for a nickel, get a special feature, the comedy, the newsreel, and everything for a nickel. Hmm. And if it was times were right, Dad would give us another nickel. We, My brother and I would split a candy bar. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. And um, do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard about Pearl Harbor being bombed? Well, we were at home. Uh, I can't remember the time or the actual day, but we were listening to the radio. And uh, FDR made the announcement. So, you know, everybody was in shock. What are we going to do now? What's going to happen? And it was really a shock. Of course, we had no television or anything. We right. just, just had the radio. Right, right. So, Did you have any thoughts at that time that, boy, I'm, I'm probably going to get pulled into this thing? Or, well, uh, I, yeah, we, uh, we knew we were, that one of us or both of us were, of course, my younger brother hadn't been born yet. Right. We knew one or both would be going. Well, as it turned out, uh, we left some of the young boys on the farm. Well, that was my next question. Being on a farm, could you have gotten a deferral to... Well, uh, Dad was able to get the older brother, okay. my older brother, to stay and work on the farm. Okay. So I was the one that it was called that. Okay. So how soon after you got uh, the welcome from Uncle Sam did you ship off? Uh... Well, again, the dates. Uh, we were called up. We had to go to Denver for physical. So we rode the train all night long from Alamosa to Denver. Took our physical and went home, and then within a few days away, we were called up. Now, when you left left home to go off, did you go off with uh, any buddies or any, or did you go friends, or did you go off by yourself? Uh, or? The night I left, I was by myself, but several other kids from the community were within days of going to. Several of us went together for physicals, but we were a few days apart on actually being inducted. But did did your, your family see you off that? They did, and uh, I remember I was in one car, and I, I walked back through the door to the next car, and uh, wow. give them a second wave. And, uh, yeah. and that was a long ride to Denver. I was a pretty lonely kid. Oh. Yeah, well, it must have been. Uh, that's always my next question, too. Uh, well, a little bit further on, uh, you go off to, and what, I guess I forgot, what branch were you uh, drafted into? I was in the Air Force. Air Force? Okay. Okay. In the Air Force. All right. And so then, uh, 
uh, you get to Denver and take your story from there then. Okay, uh, got to Denver and uh, went into Fort Logan. And that's, that's where we were on June 4th, I think it was. Uh, they announced, uh, was it D-Day? No, oh, June 6th. Uh-huh. Or June 6th. Uh-huh. So we were only there in Fort Logan a few days, and then we were transferred out to Buckley Field in East Denver. And that's where we started our basic training and, uh, you know, physical and, and weaponry and all that, and our bivouac out east of Denver. And that's where we got our basic training. And then where'd you, where'd you go from there after your basic? From there, uh, we went to Kingman, Arizona. And that's where we started our real shooting of a... Well, first of all, we were on the back ends of pickups, driving around about a mile and a half circle shooting air to ground targets with shotguns. Oh, so now, oh, were you being trained as a gunner then? Mm -hmm. Okay. After that, we were, uh, we were on a line. They had uh, 50 caliber machine guns mounted on a post, and we were shooting at targets 100 yards, 200 yards, 300 yards away. And, of course, they were, you know, scoring us on how we were shooting. And then after that, we were in a mounted... See, I, I was being trained as a ball turret gunner. Oh, boy. On a B-17. Well, they had these turrets mounted on big trucks, and we were shooting at a moving target, a railroad car with a six-by-six-foot target on it, 600 yards away. And our aim was to shoot those posts off so they'd have to stop and put a new target up. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's where we got our uh, start of training on 50 caliber. Down in Kingman? Yeah, in Kingman. Okay. Now, along with that training... Uh, before we started shooting, we had to know how to assemble and disassemble that gun, both blindfolded and with gloves on. And we were timed on how fast we could do it. And, uh, well, one other thing that happened down there, nearly every day there was a crash of a plane somewhere. Is that right? Wow. Smoke would be billowing up out in the desert. And Legs would be half mast. Would that? Uh, how would that play on your mind? Thinking, you know, I'm uh, I'm going to be going up here pretty uh, soon. Yeah, who's going to be next? Yeah. Uh, 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 now, have, prior to the service, had you ever been in an airplane before? Never. Had, wow. No. Wow. And and how was that? Uh, I mean, many in your your generation in that time period, growing up, you really never traveled too far away from home or from the family farm. Now you're off. How was uh, how was that for you as far as homesickness and such, and how was that transition going from civilian life to military life for you? Well, it was a change going to military, but I was never really, really homesick. I knew I was in there and I was going to serve. So that's, I made up my mind I'm going to do it. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Well, after this training on the ground, then we started flying. And... Uh, the first flight in that old 17 over the desert, you'd fly over a green spot, you know, and there'd be heat waves and the plane would drop. And so that was a sensation. Uh -huh. But we were flying about 500 feet up and shooting out of the waist at ground targets. And, of course, being scored again on how well you were doing. Well, now, how did you come to become a gunner? Was that something you tested for or uh, volunteered for or were just told you're going to be a gunner? Uh, I was just assigned to be a ball turret gunner. Okay, on okay. 17. I said, wow, here I go, you know. Well, then, of course, you, we had to have training on how to operate the turret, both on, in mock-up and then in the plane. And as you can see my size now, uh, I couldn't get in one now. Yeah, that, that's always my, that was my next question. Yeah. Describe what it's like there. It seems so claustrophobic and small. Well, you, you're like a embryo in, the, <laughs> in this little round deal. You have a window between your knees, about 10 inch window diameter. You have a little window on each side of you. And the 
gun sight right in front of your face here. So you look through the sight through the window and he had a, a hairline like this and two little lines that you could close in on the target and then the trigger on the right hand. Now, when, uh, you, when you would take off, uh, would you ride the uh, bolt turret or wait until you got into... No, we, we were inside the plane. And then after you got airborne, you'd get in the turret and go... Yeah. You, when you got in, the guns were pointing straight down. And then when you got in the turret, you closed the hatch and locked it, and then you could operate the turret. 360 degrees up and down and it had automatic cutoffs for the tail wheel and for the props so you wouldn't shoot, shoot them yeah oh, okay now the uh, the original planes the older ones that we first were in you could not get a parachute between you and the gun sight so the parachute was inside the plane and you know if anything happened you, uh, no way you're going to get out there and get that shoot but there was a, a hand, two hand controls up here on the door. You, you turn the guns down and open that up and get out, and then you could bring the barrels back up for landing. Well, on the newer, well, let's see. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Well, after the, all the training in uh, Kingman, then we went to Dyersburg, Tennessee. And that's where we were assigned our crew. Now, between between the time you got to Denver and entered the service and went off to Tennessee, did you get any, any yeah. leaves home at all? We, we had furlough. We had a week, uh, I think it was a 10-day furlough in between time. Came back up through Denver, through Lincoln, Nebraska, of all places, and down to Dyersburg on a train. Hmm. You know, everything was on a train. Right, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we could sleep, and most of the time we were sitting up or dozing off, you know. So we get to Dyersburg, and again, that's where we formed our crew. Okay. And then we started uh, cross-country missions, day and night, high altitude, low altitude, stormy weather, or good weather, or whatever. We were out flying. Well, descri describe for those that will watch this uh, tape what it's like in the airplane, because you weren't pressurized and it wasn't heated. What uh, what were conditions like in there? Well, all we had was a, a pair of coveralls and a, a jacket and gloves. Now, the gloves, some of them did have a battery in them. They were somewhat heated, but a lot of people were they'd get a short and they'd burn their hands and so they weren't the best. No, there was no heat in the plane and no oxygen. Well, we had uh, oxygen mask. We had some, but, you know, uh, <laughs> it was actually useless. Is that right? Oh, jeez. Uh, you know. uh. So, <clears throat> but before, before actually flying to in, in Dyersburg, we went in. They put us in pressure chambers to experience a lack of oxygen. And they'd have you write your name, and you know, you'd think you're doing great, but it's just a scribble, you know, you just, I mean, you're out of it. Wow. Uh. And uh, didn't have anything to do with flying, but they would run us through uh, smoke uh, like gas attacks, and you'd have to put on your oxygen mask to go through that and burn your eyes and stuff. And so, let's see. <clears throat> We flew down over the Gulf from Dyersburg. We flew up to Chicago. We flew over Madison, Wisconsin. We flew over Scottfield, Illinois. We made a lot of trips around there. Just navigation runs, uh, mock bombing runs. That was more for the pilot and co-pilot and the radio man. That was their training. We, the gunners, were just, you know, just kind of riding along on those missions, mm -hmm. but again, down in Dyersburg, uh, here again, there were several airplane crashes, and as we would take off down there, you could see places along the Mississippi where the planes had crashed and just 
wiped out the vegetation, you know, from, from the crash. We'd go to breakfast and there'd be a table of nine missing people, you know. Oh, boy. Wow. And, then, you know, the next day or so it would be filled up with another crew. But that was fairly common, flags at half-mast. And I never was very well acquainted with any of those losses, but there, it happened every other day or so. Yeah. Well, from there, we went to Savannah, Georgia for a couple of nights, and then we headed overseas. Now, roughly, uh, we don't need exact dates or stuff, but roughly what time period was this? Uh, 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 in uh, Hunter Field, Savannah, Georgia, this was March of 45. 45, okay. All right. And we're heading overseas. Now, did you guys fly your plane over? Did you take a ship over? How did you we, get it? A... We flew. We flew up over... Uh, Washington, D.C. to Grenier Field, New Hampshire, Goose Bay, Labrador, Bluey West, Greenland, Meeks Field, Iceland, Valley Field, Wales, and then by train to Stone, England, and then to Peterborough, where our 351st Bomber Group was, 351st? was located. Now, on the way over, there were some experiences. Uh, oh, yeah. In, That's a pretty treacherous route. Go, <laughs> please tell them. In uh, Goose Bay, the snow was clear over the barracks. We had to walk down in a tunnel to get into them. Uh, to Greenland, we got there at night, and the runway was lit with just, they told us, way a lot of lamps, you know, just little, you could barely see them. And so you, we were landing, he flew into a little fjord mm -hmm. and made a sharp right turn and then down. Very treacherous. Wow, wow. And so we made our landing and then we got out and we were standing around waiting to see the rest of them coming in. And you know, every once in a while you see the landing lights and well, here comes another one, you know, and we, we hope he makes it, you know. <laughs> Hmm. And then we were there, I think it was two nights at Greenland, then went on to Iceland. Had a terrific windstorm in Iceland. Two of us, I was one of them, we had to go out and sleep in our airplane that night to, you know. Keep the weight? Huh. Rocking and rocking, and, but we slept there. Wow. Huh. Uh, the rest of the flight on in was, was okay. Now, for example, in a, in, a, in a trip like that, you wouldn't sit down in a turret then, would you? Would you oh, no. Yeah, okay. okay. No, we're, yeah. we're up in the waist. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then so you land in England, and you said you took the train down, so you left that plane behind? or We left that plane in Valley uh, Field there in Wales, and we took a train. Now, I'm not sure what happened to that plane, but our crew did not fly it on in. So when we got into Petersburg, then we we were assigned a, a regular plane, and the name of it was Seventeen and Miss Led, L E D D. Not sure who Miss Led was, but that was the name of our plane. <laughs> and I don't know if. I could give you the names of our crew members if you... Look at this as your tape, so you feel free okay. to. You bet. I'm going to read these. Yeah, sure. Our uh, pilot was Bill Rice. Co-pilot Aaron Cushman. Navigator Daniel Steelman. Bombardier Maurice Johnson. Engineer Floyd Hansen. Radio man Jack Muth. Waist gunner Fred Suter, tail gunner Victor Hughes, and ball turret gunner yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> now the 351st was part of the 8th Air Force. This was the 8th Air Force. Okay, and did uh, was there were you in a squadron? Uh, we were, but I don't recall. Okay, that's fine. That. That's fine. Okay. I don't recall the number. So, but. Let me ask you, here's, here's a farm boy from uh, Center, Colorado. 
once again, like I said earlier, really probably never traveled too far away from home growing up. Now you zigzagged all over the country, took this route across the North Atlantic, and are now in England. What was that like uh, uh, to experience something like that? Well, again, it was a it was a great experience. Uh, of course, I wrote letters at home all the time, and we would get letters from home delivered to us, and they were censored, of course. How was that? Was that pretty reliable, the mail service? It was very reliable. Okay, okay. And uh, we were we were cautioned on what we could write. Sure, on. yeah. But uh, yeah, we got mail and occasionally package, and that you know that was great. Talk a little bit about the base. How was your uh, your accommodations and food and just living general living conditions for you there at the base? We had a, there were small barracks, stone, made out of stone, and they, each one of them had a dugout for, you know, in case of bombing or okay. whatever, we uh -huh. could get in our own dugouts. It was not a very large base as far as barrack facilities, but uh, there was a number of planes there. It was it was a huge base for for airplanes. We also had P fifty one fighter escort planes on that base. The food was great. Uh, we had Coca Cola. We had Coca Cola syrup. We made our own cokes. Hmm. Uh, water wasn't too tasty, but you know we, we were well fed, well taken care of. Yeah, and yeah. and. If I'm in the impression right, the barracks, the enlisted men stayed, men yeah. stayed together and the, and the officers right. stayed yeah. separate. Yeah. This was always the case, yeah. both here in the States and all Sure, way. right. How, how was it as far as, uh, what would you guys do on your, on your time off as far as entertaining yourself? And, uh, uh, over there, uh, a tail gunner from another crew, he and I played one-on-one uh, -on -one volleyball at night in a little building. But we each had, we all had bicycles. We bought English bicycles. And there was a little town about, oh, I think three or four miles away. We'd ride into the town and we would have a dark colored beer, English beer. Uh -huh. And just sit around and visit and then ride back home. How was interaction with the locals? Were they? They were, they were very friendly, yeah. of course. Yeah. Very friendly people. And how, how was the uh, English weather for you? I mean, it's quite drastic from the San Luis Valley uh, weather. Uh, actually, the weather wasn't bad at all. Oh, really? Yeah. Really. Okay. It was nice. Okay. Uh, and there again, we started some training flights. We, uh, in preparation for missions, we would uh, <laughs> practice, this is for pilots now, practice formations take off at four o'clock in the morning and climb and climb and climb and wait for the next group to climb and climb until you got into your wing formation and then we'd fly over the cliffs of Dover or whatever and then disassemble, come back and land. Now, I, I for understand, I mean, that that was a pretty dangerous part of the mission just because with the weather and, and as close, how close you guys flew together and... I'm saying we're probably less than 30, 40 feet apart. Wow. Those big bombers. Wow. You know, wingtip to wingtip. Yeah. And in takeoff, you take off every 30 seconds. So if you got in the, the slip wash or whatever you call uh -huh. it, the, the leading plane, there was a lot of uh, unstableness to your, your takeoff. Wow. Wow. We took off at 115 and landed at, uh, I think it was 95. And uh, we actually got up to 30,000 one time in that B-17. We didn't stay long, but the pilot says, I'm going to do it. And so we said, okay, <laughs> we'll go with you. Have <laughs> you had any choice in the matter? We couldn't right? bail out, so we, yeah. But again, you know, with, we were on oxygen up there, yeah, but you right. can't stay very long because they were built for high altitude. So, uh, well, let's see. That, well, there was another, in this little town, too, there was a USO club. And we could go in there for dances and, you know, they had uh, refreshments and whatnot. So we were, we were taken care of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, long, 
some time to go on missions. And our crew was called up four times. And the first three times, they called a stand down. They'd shoot the red flare and we just taxi back and we were off till the next call. Well, the last call, we were on the runway and ready to take off and we were actually about ready to turn on and shot the flag again and so I never got on a mission. Oh, is that right? Because you're right there at the tail end of the war anyhow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So I often thought, you know, uh, what would have been like to go on one, but I'm, I have no regrets. So right. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was timing and that's, that's the way it was. Absolutely. So, yeah. So after the end of the war over there, uh, our crew, our pilot, co-pilot, uh, navigator, engineer, and radio man, and some other crews flew down to, uh, flew over into Germany, and uh, to even clear to Italy to fly prisoners of war back home. And I never got to go on one of those either because there was no need. Right. But they did that for, oh, two, a couple of months or so, I guess. So it wasn't very long, you know, we were sent back home. So we came back essentially the same route, <clears throat> except that our navigator missed uh, Greenland. And we flew from there direct to Bradley Field, Connecticut. Wow. No worries. Of, you had plenty of fuel. And well, we had no fuel, thankful. <laughs> wow. We were, they were, they were scared. Wow. But wow. we made it. Uh -huh. And then, uh, then from there, Camp, let's see, which was Bradley Field, and then Camp Miles Standish, Massachusetts. And then came home for 30 days, furlough again. <clears throat> And then, uh, okay, so get another deal and go back to uh, Fort Logan again in Denver for reassignment. Now, had the war in uh, the Pacific ended at that time? No, not yet. Okay, so was there any chance that you might have been... Yeah. Well, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. So we go back to Fort Logan again, reassignment. <clears throat> they sent us to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Now, was your, your crew still no, intact? No, we're all disassembled. Okay. This is just me now. Okay. <clears throat> and so, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We stayed there, I think it was about a week, waiting for, you know, where we're going to go. Well, we wound up going to Fort Myers, Florida for gunnery training on a B-29. And it's an entirely different airplane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the center of that waist of that airplane was <clears throat> deal called Central Fire Control. And I would say I, for instance, if I were there, I could control all the guns on the plane. Right, right. All the 50 calibers. And it was a flying fortress. And there was a tunnel between that waste gunner to the, to the pilots. It was about, I'd say, I'm 20 feet long or so. We had to crawl through that tunnel. So needless to say, we didn't make many trips through there. We stayed in our positions. And, but again, never got to fly in one. Just took the training. And then uh, the war in Japan was over. So got to come back home again for another furlough. And then uh, sent us to uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And there we were just, you know, killing time. I was an athletic instructor. I, I, we had a basketball team. I played on a basketball team. I was a supply cook, collecting supplies off from discharged people, you know, watches and all this kind of stuff. Uh, again, just we just killed time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We went swimming, we just really had a ball. Went in town every Saturday night for dinner. And then we went to uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas for a discharge. 
And as I walk out the door, there's a fellow at the st- sitting there and he said, would you like to re-enlist? <laughs> <laughs> I said, thank you, but no thank you. I'm going home. Yeah, yeah. So I hitchhiked all the way back to my hometown. From, from Fort Leavenworth? From Fort Leavenworth. Is that how long did it take you? Uh, it took me two or three days <laughs> to get there. But, you know, GIs could hitchhike anywhere back in, the, in those days. Yeah, yeah. So that was uh, that was kind of the end of the military. Yeah. Okay. Well, so. let's let's take your story from uh, uh, your post-military. Then uh, once you get your your home now and okay, so <clears throat> back on the farm again, and uh, it's a potato farm. A lot of uh, hand labor, irrigation, and work, and all this and that. And uh, so I worked there. Uh, for a year and then I applied for the GI Bill and I was accepted. I started at Adams State College in Alamosa. Uh, went there, uh, what, 47 I think I started there. 48 and 9. But in the meantime we were going to dances at our old Hooper School and of course she had gone to the same school. And we became better and better acquainted. So you knew her before you went off to the service? Yeah. I okay. Did. No. She was younger than I. Mm-mm. I wasn't there when you went to the service. Oh, better. Can we erase that part, I guess? Oh, no, just say, explain. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she, no, we didn't. Oh, okay. It was later than that. So you met at the dances then? Yeah, right. So when did we start going? Uh, 40... 48 or so, we started dancing together. And I'm uh, going to Adam State and I find out I didn't have, they didn't have what I really wanted. So I decided to transfer up here to Fort Collins to Colorado A&M. Well, in 1951, June 15th, that was yesterday, <laughs> we got married. And we came up here to finish summer school and then on into the fall term. And so I finished school in December of 51. Then we came back up and... What did you get your degree in? Uh, in soils. Soils? Okay. I was a soil scientist. Came back up in June of 52 for graduation. So I'm a 52 grad. Uh, and then, let's see, we go back home to Alamosa, and our first son was born in Alamosa, and I can't remember the dates. September 51, 52. September 52, our first boy was born. Uh... Then, let's see, I then I got a job with the soil, USDA, Soil Conservation Service, as a soil scientist. And we're transferred uh, out here to Julesburg, Colorado, mm-hmm. northeast corner. And that's where I started my career in soils. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I got to back up. We, I was in Durango for three months first, and okay. then, then to Jillsburg. Jillsburg. Worked there for a number of years, 13 years. I injured my back, had to have spinal surgery, so it took me 13 years to finish the soils inventory of Cedric and Phillips counties, and they are now uh, USDA publications. but. And from there, we were transferred to Steamboat Springs. And then I worked all over. The, I, I was in Route County, but worked over uh, Moffat, uh, Jackson, Rao Blanco, and Eagle counties. And that was a big territory. Yeah, oh, you bet. And, uh, and then let's see, from there. I was transferred to Lincoln, Nebraska as an assistant 
state soil scientist, more supervisory work now. I'm in the office looking after those guys that are digging the hole. <laughs> <laughs> so we were there uh, about seven years. And then Six from years. there, I uh, was transferred to Madison, Wisconsin, as the head of the soils in that state. Oh, wow. State soil scientist. And I worked there until, uh, what, January of 86. In October of 86, we came back to Fort Collins and our home here. So that's when you retired then? And I retired in January. Uh, how many years did you have with the USDA then altogether? I had 32 with uh, USDA and uh, actually two years military. Wow. So 30, wow. 34 years. So that's. Our other three children were born out here in Julesburg. So you had four uh, children all together? Four children. And grandchildren? We have ten grandchildren. One married and one engaged. <laughs> and any uh, great-grandchildren? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Through the years, did you, uh, did you keep in touch with your, your old crew? Uh, ever uh, get together or any sort of reunions or anything I, like that? I kept in touch with my engineer because he was from Pueblo. Oh, okay. Close by. The rest were back east. Well, one was in, in Idaho and the rest were east. And he actually came up to the farm once to see us. And I visited with him and then he was, he, he re-enlisted and went back overseas somewhere, I don't remember. And that was about the end of the contact with the old crew. Yeah, yeah. Everybody got involved in different things. And yeah, yeah. Too far away. Oh, you bet, you bet. Any uh, chance through the years uh, to travel back to any of the places you were stationed in the States or England or anything like that? Never got back to England at all and, uh, and well, we were, you know, we never did get back to any of the, what? any of the old bases I was on. No. No. Okay. No. Okay. We were sure to Ironsburg, but we didn't go to any Fort yeah. Well, well, we'll start to wind down this interview. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you'd like to talk about? And Leona, please feel free to enter, uh, jump in as well. Or any stories that have popped up as we've been talking that you'd like to uh, talk about so we hopefully round out this whole story as best we can. Well, I could go back to a couple of stories. Please do, yes. Service. I mentioned before we each had bicycles over in England. So <clears throat> there was a little forested area off base that we used to ride down for kind of recreation. And so this buddy of mine and I were down there one day and we thought, you know, let's, let's get our other buddy to come down with us tomorrow. So we go down there tomorrow and this big gate is shut. And uh, I got to back up here. Uh, the gate was shut the first day. It was a big curve. It was a big curve and you couldn't see this gate. So we lead our guy down there the next day. And the gate is shut again. And we're, we're in, in the lead. So we pull our bikes out in the the trees real quick and he comes around that curve for the last. <laughs> Puts on his brakes and slides out into some stinging nettles. He didn't hit the gate but he slid out in the stinging nettles and he, he just got it all over his arms and face. Oh and boy. He was ready to kill us. <laughs> uh, uh, what was the other one I was going to tell you? Oh yes. This is way back at the first when we were in uh, Kingman, Arizona, in some of our early air-to-ground missions. Charles Bronson was his name. He's a movie star known as Charles Businski. He was in the same barracks, about three beds down. Huh. And he and I uh, and others were on several 
air to ground flights over Arizona. And on one mission, you know, if you fire this waste gun machine gun for too long at one time, the barrel would get hot and the bullets would actually cook off. They would explode on their own. Oh boy. Well, this happened and the guy grabbed the bolt and as he pulled it back, a hot bullet fell inside the airplane. Charles Bushinsky fell, grabbed a coat or something and fell on that bullet to protect us. Wow. Uh. It, never, it never exploded, but had it exploded, he would have been gone. Uh. I often thought, of, you know, what a guy. Wow, right, yeah. yeah. Uh, so he was an actor at the time as well, or he yeah. got his fame later no, on? He was an actor later on. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh. yeah. This air base in uh, Kingman, uh, Jimmy Stewart went through there. Donald O'Connor, the movie star, he went through there. I don't know how many others, you know, but... Hmm. Did you, in any of the places you, you, you served or over in England, uh, was there any sort of U.S. show that, uh, the USO show that brought any famous people that you went to see, you know? Well, I'm sure there were, but none that I was able to attend. Oh, okay. They had U.S.O.s there in yeah, this little yeah, town, but right. I didn't get yeah. to see any. Yeah. Didn't get to see Bob Ope or anything. Oh, okay. All <laughs> right. Did you ever have a chance to, to get... Uh, a pass and go into London at all while you were over there? We went into London <clears throat> one time, yeah, we went in one time. Was there still quite a bit of damage from the bombings there? We never saw any of it. Oh, okay, no. okay. We just got into Piccadilly Square and we went into, uh, well, we saw the changing of the guard, uh, Westminster Abbey. I, I've got some booklets over here that I have, but yeah, we got to see quite a few things there. London Bridge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was that was quite an experience. Yeah, wonderful. <clears throat> London was a <clears throat> rather I thought rather dreary. The old buildings are dark colored stone, you know, and mm -hmm. of course much older than we are. Right, right, right. Kind of depressing at times, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, well, like I said, we'll we'll wind down this interview if. Uh, uh, Anything else? Or do you think? Where do you think we covered it all? Pretty good. Well, I think we pretty well covered it. I have some pictures. Yeah, we'll look at you, pictures if you'd like to look at those. Okay. One last question: I always ask at the the tail end of this interview is, how do you think that period of time, your military experience, uh, played a role in your life, changed your life, affected your life, or was it just simply a, a chapter of your life that you went through? Do you? How would you answer that? Well, I think it. I think it changed, uh, it, it matured me rather early. <laughs> it gave you advantages too. Yeah, it gave a lot of advantages for the GI Bill, for instance, but uh, coming home to school, to Adams State College, I mean, the veterans were, you know, we were privileged people. <laughs> well, you deserved it, you earned and, it. You know, and even though I wasn't over there that long, never saw combat, I. I was there. Absolutely. I was part of the military. Yep. But yeah, it, it, it had an effect on your life. Yeah. Okay. Well, John, I want to thank you for uh, sitting down to tell your story today, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. This is a picture of me taking... Uh, well, I was in the 8th Air Force. I think the picture was taken in uh, Peterborough, England. I was in the 8th Air Force, 351st Bomber Group. This is a picture of <clears throat> my mother and I taken on the farm during one of my furloughs while I was at home. Now, after the war, did she ever talk about uh, what she was thinking, how she was feeling with you overseas and really not knowing where you were at? And <clears throat> well, she was continually worried about what's going to happen, and she wrote almost daily letters. <laughs> Is that right? How are you doing? How are you doing? And so I I wrote back and told them everything I could. Yeah, yeah. With, within very But you were censored. You really couldn't tell them everything. Couldn't tell yeah. them everything, yeah. but I told them I was fine, and things were going well. And so, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. 
This is a picture of me in Peterborough, England on our air base, 351st Bomber Group. I'm right down by the ball turret. That's my little home. Well, you must have had a hell of a view uh, <laughs> from inside there when you were up in the air. Not really. No, really? Oh, no? Not, not really. at all? No. Oh. Oh, here's oh. a picture of your family with air This is another picture of our air crew over uh, in Peterborough, England. This is our full crew, and I'm right here, this little person right there. Okay. That's the full air crew, nine of us, on our B-17, 17 and misled. Okay, this is a picture of the uh, enlisted men on our crew. In the back row, from left to right, is Victor Hughes, Jack Souter, and uh, and uh, Floyd Hansen. And kneeling, I'm on the left, and Jack Muth, the radio man, on the right. So the B-17 would make up a crew of five enlisted and four officers. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Nine. In recent months, I was able to send in a donation to the World War II uh, Memorial, and then uh, more recently, the National World War II Museum down in New Orleans. So I'm a charter member of each of those uh, organizations. Now, I know here in September, you'll go to visit the, the World War II uh, mm -hmm. Memorial. Have you been to either one of these places yet? Uh, we've been to D.C., but we've not seen this. Okay. We had an invitation to go to the dedication, but couldn't make it. Right, right. And you haven't, uh, haven't been out of the museum in New Orleans? No. Okay. This is a picture of uh, Leona and I, our 50th wedding anniversary. And our whole family is here together. We've not been able to get everyone together since then as a whole group. So we thought we'd give you this one. <laughs> 